Hi Swifties, welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. I am the Taylor Swiftologist and today I'm going to be reacting to and analyzing, breaking down Taylor Swift's 2022 NYU commencement speech. So if you're new to my channel, I'm a journalist by trade and a Swifty by proud choice. And in my free time, I like to devote my analytical and organizational skills to dissecting the public life of pop persona Taylor Swift, who is, you know, one of the most exciting artists of our time, in my humble opinion. Um, so I have been away for a while. I was on vacation. I was supposed to go to a wedding, uh, my best friend's wedding actually, and I got COVID when I was in New York. So I couldn't go to the wedding, but you know what I could do? I could sit at home and watch the commencement speech, which I also didn't do because I was just, you know, kind of in a rut. So I read the transcript. It's half reaction, half analysis because I've read the transcript, but I haven't like actually sat down and watched the full thing yet. Um, she looks beautiful as always. And she's in Speak Now colors, um, Speak Now Hive, Rise up taylor's version is coming soon i know it and i will not be taking further questions about that at this time so if you're new here do subscribe and like this video and leave me a comment and let me know what kind of videos you want to see i am definitely kind of pivoting more towards doing video essays and cultural criticism critique analysis i think i'm going to have a speak now album breakdown coming up soon and then also maybe a deep dive into the girl bossery of it all i'm talking about the girl squad taylor Swift's very controversial girl squad i'm going to break it down what happened why it was important and why it fell apart if any of that sounds interesting to you stay tuned make sure to subscribe like i said and um let me know what you want to see next uh so i guess we can just get straight into it i'm gonna skip through the like boring stuff the acknowledgements the listing of the provost and all of that um because i'm pretty sure the taylor only learned their names <laughs> the morning of this speech she definitely didn't know who they were before this but yes i'm gonna skip to the good shit family members mentors teachers allies friends and loved ones here today who have supported these students in their pursuit of educational enrichment. Let me say to you now, welcome to New York. It's been waiting for you. Classic. Classic. It had to be done. I would go sicko mode if this was me at my graduation. I'd okay, like I would to thank NYU insane. for making me technically on paper at least a doctor this bitch is so charming it's like actually a bit scary not the type of doctor you would want around in case of an emergency certainly not unless your specific emergency was that you desperately needed to hear a song with a catchy hook and an intensely I actually cathartic do think that kind of bridge doctor, section so you can hit me up with a number tree pain thank you Or if your emergency was that you needed a person who can name over 50 breeds of cats <clears throat> in one minute. Something Taylor is always going to do is make her personality entirely about having cats, owning cats, loving them, knowing a lot about them. Um, she let a lot of things from 2012 go, but one of the things that she hasn't let go is the um, glorification of being a cat lady. Okay, we need to discuss that. We need to break it down. Now is not the time, but... You know, in front of 90,000 people, she was like, I must bring up the fact that I'm obsessed with cats yet again, in case you didn't already know, from me walking out of my apartment with my cat slung over my shoulder. I never got to have a normal college experience, per se. I went to public high school until 10th grade and then finished my education doing homeschool work on the floors of airport terminals. Then I went out, out on the road for radio tour, which sounds incredibly glamorous, but in reality, it consisted of a rental car, motels, and my mom and I pretending to have loud mother-daughter fights with each other during boarding, so no one would want the empty seat between us on South. Okay, first of all, she is so charming. Um, I don't know how people can hate her when they see her talk like this. Like, she is just so unbelievably well media trained. It's a little scary, as I've mentioned. Also, something that I think that is um, really interesting to note here, and always I like to keep in the back of my mind, is that just because she had certain privileges in terms of like getting some leverage in the music industry doesn't mean that she was handed a good reputation or that she was handed success on a platter. She might have had the resources to spring off a little bit easier than other artists, but I mean, her success is due to her sheer force of will, as in she would not give up and she was not going to take no for an answer. Um, and at the beginning of her career, during the debut when she was promoting Tim McGraw specifically, um, she put in the fucking FaceTime. She showed up at the radio stations to shake hands and say thank you. She 
wrote handwritten notes. She remembered people's names. She was personable. She was lovely. She um, ingratiated herself into the community, which is why she was so successful, because she's fairly easy to work with and she is a pleasure to be around. So I think that is a lesson to be learned for any recent college graduate, you know, that a little bit of niceness and kindness and personability really does go a long way. And for Taylor, it still has and it continues to. You hardly ever hear of someone from a professional standpoint, criticizing her personality, her work ethic, her attitude, um, bad behavior on set or bad behavior at all behind the scenes is really just something we don't hear about. Um, And I personally believe that all of these things eventually come to light. So if she was being evil behind the scenes, I think that we would know about it. Let's look at Ellen DeGeneres as a good example of what happens when you are a little tyrant to the people that work for you. She has a corporation at this point. So I really do think that there would have been a whistleblower by now if she was the worst person in the world. As a kid, I always thought I would go away to college, imagining the posters I would hang on the wall of my freshman dorm. I even said the ending of my music video for my song Love Story at my fantasy imaginary she college, did. where I meet a male model reading a book on the grass. And with one single glance, we realized we had been in love in our past lives. She's so funny. And also it's true. She really did want to go to college. I feel like Taylor, you know, as a chronicler of those of the human condition and specifically when she was younger, she was really obsessed with like high school archetypes and, um, you know, f- kind of trying to solve the problem of whatever generational age or like life experience and event she was going through, whether it was like losing your virginity, dating a boy on the football team, um, having your uh, high school boyfriend be a prince on a white horse. She was very interested in those like markers of the passage of time and not having that I think is something that she definitely missed out on and misses like I feel like this is a full circle moment for her getting to do this commencement address Um, I remember when I met her in Dublin and I told her where I was going to college and she got so excited she knew the college she knew exactly like what kind of vibe the college was and we talked about it and she um, really lit up when we discussed it so I think that you know she is a smart and curious person I think she would have thrived in a college environment but you know she kind of took a different path Poor girl. (laughs) Just kidding. All her dreams came true. Which is exactly what you guys all experienced at some point in the last four years, right? The self-awareness. We love it. But I really can't complain about not having a normal college experience to you because you went to NYU during a global pandemic, being essentially locked into your dorms and having to do classes over Zoom. Everyone in college during normal times stresses about test scores. But on top of that, you also had to pass like a thousand COVID tests. I imagine the idea of a normal college experience was all you wanted to. But in this case, you and I both learned that you don't always get all the things in the bag that you selected from the menu in the delivery surface. That it- this is so true and kind of interesting to me in that Taylor sometimes lacks perspective, right? Like she lacks the ability to connect with experiences that are not directly somehow related to her. And comparing the fact that she didn't get everything she wanted from life from, you know, students who had to weather their college experience through a pandemic, I mean, the vibe is kind of off, but I see where she's going with this. And I feel like this is kind of where things get misconstrued sometimes. I saw some critiques about her being out of touch or like whatever, um, but all she can really do as a commencement speaker is speak from her own personal experience. And I think she's trying to relate. So I I personally, you know, will give her a pass for that because I think that she's trying her hardest to relate to these people expect um which is especially hard given the level of success privilege fame wealth that she has in comparison to these like 22 year old children although nyu is not exactly a rough place to land for a young person so it's life you get what you get and as i would like to say to you wholeheartedly you should be very proud of what you've done with it today you leave new york university and then go out into the world searching what's next and so will See, I. okay, this is an Easter egg, you guys. Look at the way that she looked straight into the camera with that little mischievous glare of hers. She's up to no good. She is up to no good here. She's trying to tell us something. This reminds me of, what was it, the Billboard Music Awards when she showed up in that lover-esque outfit and she was like hinting at what was coming next. Or was it when she wore that purple dress? I'm not sure, but there was a speech. There was a time she gave up and she said something cryptic. She looked dead ass straight into the camera and said, I am looking for what's next. What does that mean? What does it mean? Um, I think 
uh, hypothesis. I mean, I don't think she's talking about re-recordings. I think she's maybe talking about like what's next for her original music. She still doesn't know yet. That would be my, and by original, I mean like new music, not re-recorded music. Um, that would be my my hunch, my my guesstimation. But as always, I could be looking too far into that. As a rule, I try not to give anyone unsolicited advice unless they ask for it. I'll go into this more later. Hmm. I don't know. I feel like that's not true. She is constantly giving advice. And usually that advice like takes the form of her sharing about her own personal experience and then you can glean what you want from there. So maybe I'll maybe I'll side with her on this one. But I would say that in general she has like a sisterly vibe. Like I feel like she is definitely the girlfriend that you want to have that is like telling you exactly how she feels about what you're doing. I have a feeling that that has gotten her into trouble with her friends in the past. And I'm going to specifically point to Selena Gomez in that instance. Um, maybe that's a topic for another video. I think their relationship is very complicated, but I digress. Back to the, back to the speech. Please bear in mind that I in no way feel qualified to tell you what to do. You've worked and struggled and sacrificed and studied and dreamed your way here today. And so you know what you're doing. You'll do things differently than I did them and for different reasons. So I won't tell you what to do because no one likes that. I will, however, give you some life hacks I wish I knew when I was starting out my dreams of a career and navigating life, love, pressure, choices, shame, hope, and friendship. The first of which is... That's a lot of ground to cover in a commencement speech. Heavy, especially if you try to carry it all at once. Part of growing up and moving into new chapters of your life is about catch and release. What I mean by that is... Mm, I want to pause here for a second. Catch and release is, I think, one of the dominant tools that Taylor uh, has really had to bring into her personal toolkit to deal with the world and her career. And it has taken her a long time to understand what to catch and what to release. Um, I think this is an ongoing battle for her. I think she's an extremely energetically sensitive person who needs to protect her aura and her space. Um, which is why we don't see her as much in public and why she's not as available as she used to be on social media. She's not as forthright with what's going on in her personal life. She has really learned that she needs to uh, release a lot of the stuff that she can't control. Um, so yeah, I think this is a really interesting thing for her to bring up. It's definitely part of her creative process as well, catching and releasing, because I feel as though Usually when she releases instead of catches, so catches I'm looking at like following trends and hopping on different kinds of like uh, styles that are popular in music at the moment, that doesn't always work for her, but releasing and succumbing to her creative whims and desires like she did with Folklore and Evermore, and to a certain extent with 1989 as well, um, charting her own path. When she releases and she is not thinking about how many things she needs to catch at once, she tends to come up with the most inspired creative work of hers. So. I love that she's talking about this. Knowing what things to keep and what things to release. You can't carry all things, all grudges, all updates on your ex, all enviable promotions your school bully mm -hmm. got at the hedge fund his uncle started. Decide what is yours to hold and let the rest go. Oftentimes, the good things in your life are lighter anyway, so there's more room for them. One toxic relationship can outweigh so many wonderful, simple joys. You get to pick what your life has time and room for. Be discerning. Second. See, this is something I think Taylor has really struggled with for most of her life, is being discerning. You know, we talked... She talked in Miss Americana a lot about how she was a people pleaser and she has this good girl complex and this inability to kind of um, say no sometimes. And I'm not really sure how that manifests in her professional life because I get the impression that she is in general decisive and not easily blown over by other people. Although we do know, not a lot, but we know some that Scott Borchetta definitely met her with some internal resistance with some of her creative choices while she was working with Big Machine. So that ability to be discerning and to chart your own path and to ignore the noise of other people who are maybe trying to caution you against something that you know is right. An example of this is all those white men she was sitting with in Miss Americana that were telling her not to say she was a Democrat. These are the moments where I think like being discerning has come into play and paid off in a good way for her, um, as well as, like I said, gatekeeping access to her actual life um, while trying to remain a relevant public figure. Discernment is hard, and it's especially hard for someone like Taylor, who has built a career based on being accessible and oversharing. Learn to live alongside cringe. 
No mm -hmm. matter how hard you try to avoid being cringe, you will look back on your life and cringe retrospectively. That is so true. Cringe no truer than for her. Over a lifetime. Even the term cringe might someday be deemed cringe. I promise you, you're probably doing or wearing something right now that you will look back on later and find revolting and hilarious. Can't avoid it, so don't try to. For example, I had a phase where, for the entirety of 2012, I dressed like a 1950s housewife. But you know what? I was having fun. Trends and phases are fun. Looking back and laughing is fun. I love that she brought up the notion of being cringe because Taylor has like been cringe frequently, still is to this day. It's part. It's a very important part of her character, which is earnestness. And I think she's going to go on to talk about this in a sec. But I want to talk about her bashing the phase where she dressed like a 1950s housewife. I mean, I don't view that as cringe. I thought it was regal and beautiful and excellent. Sure, sometimes she looked a little old lady or like she was wearing like a 1970s sofa. But for the most part, I thought that it was very like fitting with the red era and her Kennedy obsession that she had going on at the time. That to me is very, I guess I just have fond attachments to it. I wouldn't say that that's cringe. We're talking about cringe. May I point you in the direction of Thug Story or her Walmart sundress line? I mean, must need I go on? There are worse examples of cringe than that. Um, that was a very calculated cringe thing to announce and remind people of in this speech. And while we're talking about things that make us squirm, but really shouldn't, I'd like to say I'm a big advocate for not hiding your enthusiasm for things. This is one of my favorite things about Taylor, her earnestness and her ability to be happy in public. It seems to me that there is a false stigma around eagerness in our culture of unbothered ambivalence. This outlook perpetuates the idea that it's not cool to want it, that people who don't try are fundamentally more chic and people who do. And I wouldn't know because I've been a lot of things, but I've never been an expert on chic, but I'm the one who's up here, so you have to listen to me when I say this. Oh my God, slay. Never be ashamed of trying. Effortlessness is a myth. The people who wanted it the least were the ones I wanted to date and be friends with in high school. The people who want it the most are the people I now hire to work for my company. Mm, this is very interesting. So obviously, earnestness has been one of the most consistent characteristics that we've seen from Taylor throughout her career, and she has received a lot of negative feedback for this, um, mainly being that some people really can't even comprehend the fact that someone would be so openly joyous all the time in public. And I think that that is very sad and very reflective and indicative of the kind of cultural moment that we're at right now. Like I'm thinking of her surprise face and how she was just constantly called inauthentic or contrived for being excited and for enjoying success as it falls into her lap. Um, and speaking of falling into her lap, obviously it didn't. This goes back to her point on effortlessness. Um, Taylor is a really hard worker. And I think that it's clear that she works hard. If you go back through her career and watch the progression of her as a performer on stage. So when she started, the girl could not hold a note. She did not have a note in her head. She was a studio artist. She could get in front of a mic at close range and really focus and deliver something good. But when she got on stage, it was a fucking mess. OK, and this lasted up until Fearless, I would say, even beyond. I mean, her 2010 Grammy performance was a particularly good example of how bad she could really be. Um, and I don't say that to knock her at all. I say it to make the point that she has improved leaps and bounds as a performer. I have no doubt that she has been in intense vocal training since then. Her voice is clear. It's strong. It plays to its natural strength, which is like her cadence and her tone um, and her ability to emote through her voice. And she just needed a little bit more of a technical grasp in order to harness all of those great things that happen to comprise her voice, which is naturally just kind of mid. Like she's not a great singer. She's not a terrible singer, but she's not Mariah Carey. Okay. She's not Ariana grande um what she's really good at is writing and communicating and her voice is just a facilitator for that skill and she knew that she needed to make that skill a little bit more robust in order to deliver her message properly um i also think that she is a particularly studied performer which is why she comes across sometimes as a bit inauthentic because she rehearses because she is um, extremely observant and detail oriented when it comes to all aspects of her live performances this goes down to from the little side glances that she does 
does, the pauses between her words, the little speeches that she repeats every single night and changes ever so slightly, um, the way that she's been able to become more comfortable moving around and incorporating some choreography despite not being a natural dancer. You know, she said multiple times that choreography is really hard for her, and yet she still implements it in, to some degree in every single one of her shows from, I'd say, the Red Tour onwards. So I think that effortlessness, again, is it is a myth, and the people that you want to have around you are not the people that try to pretend like they don't care whether they're good at something or not. The people that inspire you and uplift you, like Taylor Swift, are those who are, you know, married to the thing that they're good at or the thing that they love or the thing that they want to be good at. And it doesn't even need to be a career. It's like a it's a it's a commitment to self-improvement. And I think that is what I love so much about Taylor as an artist and a performer and a writer, is that she's always looking to expand her skill, to hone her craft and sharpen her tongue. And it has um, been a really inspiring journey to walk alongside her with as a fan. I, write it, I started writing songs when I was 12, and since then, it's been the compass guiding my life, and in turn, my life guided my writing. Everything I do is just an extension of my writing, whether it's direct, directing videos or a short film, creating the visuals for a tour, or standing on a stage performing. Everything is connected by my love of the craft. The thrill of working through I see, you know, I really just, I, I agree, I resonate with this, I so, I'm so happy to hear it from her because, you know, she is a multi-talented person, she is a multifaceted artist, but it all stems from this one very deep impulse um, you know, I'm a writer too, so I connect to her kind of in this sense. Um, writing is a vocation. You know, it's something that doesn't really make sense to do. You feel compelled to do it. You wake up in the middle of the night with ideas that you have to execute, um, and you have to execute them fast or else they'll go away. And her marriage to the process, I think, really is what has carried her through more than any other skill that she has or support system that she has. Her passion and like devotion to this skill has really anchored her entire career and is is this the baseline reason for why she is a successful artist and why she's been able to kind of shape the culture the way that she has over this amount of time it's because she feels deeply and she's really good at connecting those deep feelings and articulating them to something larger than just her own experience um so i love to hear that she comes from that place when she's doing any creative thing whatsoever now how exactly that applies to songs like me I don't know. <laughs> that, that's the one instance where it just doesn't fucking add up to me. I think she was like going through some sort of stroke when that happened because it was just not, it was completely out of character for her. Ideas and narrowing them down and polishing it all up in the end, editing, waking up in the middle of the night, throwing out the old, old idea because you just thought of a new or better one or a plot device that ties the whole thing together. There's a reason they call it a hook. Sometimes a string of words just ensnares me and I can't focus on anything until it's been recorded or written down. As a songwriter, I've never been able to sit still or stay in one. That is a really good example of what it feels like to have a vocation. If you're an artist yourself, you're a writer, whatever, you'll understand exactly what I mean and what she's talking about here. Um, but you know, another part of her process that I feel like she doesn't talk about a lot that I think is really impressive and something that she has kind of hinted at over the years, if you put the little Easter eggs together, is that she's a relentless and ruthless editor. Um, she is, you know, one of the best skills you can have as a, as a creative is to not be married to the work that you put down in the first instance. Um, the worst creators, the worst writers, artists, musicians, or whatever, are the people who are sentimentally overly attached to their first draft. Your first draft is hardly ever the thing that makes it to completion. A really good example of this is all too well the 10 minute version. I mean, the 10 minute version is astounding and it is an exercise in complete like free form songwriting, word association. It is a masterpiece to behold. The five minute version is her masterpiece. It is a true feat of songwriting and that really wouldn't have been achieved. It wouldn't have had the same impact had she not had the scruples to go through it ruthlessly with her knife and cut out the stuff that didn't contribute to the overall narrative. Um, the best thing about All Too Well 10 minute version is that it um, doesn't really add anything new to the story. It just colors in the uh, details from what we got the first time around. So that's what's so impressive about her skill as an editor as well as a writer is that she's able to distill these really complex um, engaging ideas into a medium, into a framework. Having guidelines sometimes can really help you make your uh, creativity sharper and better. 
I love that she leaves room for spontaneity and surprise in the process. Um, I know she said many times that she wakes up in the middle of the night and will make an amendment to a song. She'll replace it with something better. These things, um, her, uh, her openness and her fluidity to the creative process is such a powerful part of her art. And I'm so glad to hear her talking about it um, while connecting it to the fact that she is a vocational writer. She feels compelled to do all of this. Creative place for too long. I've made and released 11 albums. And in the process, I switch genre from country to pop, to alternative, to folk. And this might sound like a very songwriter-centric line of discussion. I'd just like to make a note here that they are all pop albums. They're pop albums with different hats on, okay? Let's just, let's not, let, let's not go too far with this. But yes, she is versatile, I will say. But in a way, I really do think we are all writers. And most of us write in a different voice for different situations. We write differently in your Instagram stories than you do your senior thesis. You send a different type of email to your boss than you do your best friend from home. We are all literary chameleons, and I think it's fascinating. It's just a continuation of the idea that we are so many things all the time. And I know it can be really overwhelming figuring out who to be and when, who you are now and how to act in order to get where you want to go. I have some good news. It's totally up to you. I have some terrifying news. It's totally up to you. I said to you earlier that I don't ever offer advice. So right. It is terrifying. It, and now I'll tell you why. As a person who started my very public career at the age of 15, it came with a price. And that price was years of unsolicited advice. Being the youngest person in every room for over a decade meant mm. that I was constantly being issued warnings older members of the music industry, media, interviewers, executives. And this advice often presented itself as thinly veiled warnings. See, I was a teenager at a time when our society was absolutely obsessed with the idea of having perfect young female role models. It felt like every interview I did included slight barbs by the interviewer about me one day. I say this all the time, being Taylor Swift was really difficult in, I would say, from 2006 to 2015, probably. Um, the level of scrutiny and the amount of pressure that she put, placed upon herself, but also experienced from these other corners of the industry to be a good role model and to, di to differentiate herself from other artists by being good um, was absolutely kind of a form of internalized misogyny that we talk a lot about on our podcast, The Evolution of a Snake, where we go year by year through Taylor's career. I'll leave that linked down below. You can go and check it out. Um, but we talk about it a lot there, this good girl complex that really didn't start dissipating until probably the 1989 era. Um, but it's interesting to hear her reference where this comes from because her cognizance of this, her awareness that this is a complex that she has, is kind of underdeveloped. In Miss Americana, she addressed the fact that she felt like she had to be a good girl, but she didn't really talk about the many different manifestations that that took. And the instances in which she wielded that goodness that was afforded to her over other female artists or used it to separate herself from others and elevate herself as a morally better or superior artist and role model. Um, so it is interesting to hear her also talking about the pressure that she faced in the industry. Again, I feel like we don't really get a bird's eye view of her experience in the industry. We really get to see it through um, her creative exploits. We get to hear about the work all the time. We don't really get to hear about the challenge of creating that work or the conditions in which those work was made under because, you know, she makes it sound very like glamorous and romantic and she wakes up in the middle of the night and puts down a song and then it makes it onto the album when in reality there are like a million quality control processes that she has to go through before she can put a song on an album or decide what an album is going to be. Um, she has to take other people's input constantly for singles, for art direction, for music videos, for strategy and promotion motion there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen and at the end of the day it all reflects upon her you know the random people that are giving her advice and telling her what's good or not good to do if it blows up in in her face it doesn't matter to them they can move on and um, just say that that was you know maybe a mistake they made giving her that advice for her she's to live with those mistakes so this goes back to the discerning thing that she mentioned earlier her ability to choose what to catch and what to release has become very important and I think it's for all of these reasons that she's bringing up kind of subtly here those forces beyond just her and her immediate circle that affect the way her career has panned out running off the rails and that meant a different thing to every person who said it to me so i became a young adult while being fed the message that if i didn't make any mistakes 
all the children of America would grow up to be perfect angels. However, if I did slip up, the entire earth would fall off its axis. And it would be entirely my fault. And I would go to yeah. Pop Star Jail forever and ever. It was all centered around the idea that mistake. Okay, so let's pause here for a moment. It was not that serious to everyone else but her. As in, obviously, all of this pressure, as I mentioned before, it all comes back on her. Other people don't really give a shit what happens to her career. Um, obviously, people who are financially invested do. But pop star jail, world falling off of its axis, America's children growing up to become bad because Taylor Swift did something wrong. That, I think, is a fictive thing that was created in Taylor's brain. I don't think anybody said that. Perhaps people said it and it made her feel that way, but I don't think that that was a serious expectation that an interviewer of any kind had of her. Um, I think people were just kind of obsessed with the idea of watching women fall from pedestals. Um, but again, it was a pressure that was internal and placed on her. That's what's interesting to me about it. It reveals a lot about her inner neuroses and how she feels about her relationship to fame. Equal failure and ultimately the loss of any chance at a happy or rewarding life. This has not been my experience. My experience has been mm. that my mistakes led to the best things in my life. And being embarrassed when you mess up, it's part of the human experience. Getting back up, dusting yourself off, and seeing who still wants to Very hang true. out with you afterward and laugh about it, that's a gift. The times I was told no, or wasn't included, wasn't chosen, didn't win, didn't make the cut. Looking back, it really feels like those moments. Okay, I mean, I can think of an, a perfect example of what she's describing right off the top of my head. I mean, when she didn't win Album of the Year for Red, she connected that to a criticism that she got from the reviewers when it came out, which was that it was too chaotic and all over the place. Obviously, as a Red stand, I think that's fucking insane. But what did she do? She decided that she was going to create a work of art that was extremely sonically cohesive and could not be said to be uh, chaotic all over the place or undeserving of uh, accolades. She created 1989 in response to that criticism and that uh, no, that loss. She had the biggest moment of her career in response to that. And I've mentioned this before, but every album that she makes is a response to a prior criticism of her work. Um, I think I've touched on that in a couple of other videos, but the Red to 1989 pipeline is a good example of what she's talking about here. Something that I do appreciate about Taylor um, more generally than just this scenario that I know she's about to get into is that she um, has an amazing ability to transform and to not rise from the ashes because I really think she's only truly been knocked down once in her career and it really didn't keep her down for very long. She has absolutely overblown that incident and that period of her life. Um, it was a quick rebound. It was like less than two years and she um, definitely has gone on to be more successful than ever before. So she absolutely overestimates this, but I will say her ability to transform her uh, worldview and her opinions on different scenarios and her openness to trying new things and doing different things and charting her own path, that is absolutely something that I can get behind. Um, and a good example of her like taking a mistake or a failure and turning it into something beautiful or learning and making something better out of it would be the re-recording situation. ...with other teenagers like me who loved country music but just didn't have anyone singing from their perspective. Having journalists write in-depth, oftentimes critical pieces about who they perceive me to be made me feel like I was living in some weird simulation. But it also made me look inward to learn about who I actually this am. This is very interesting to me. Taylor has not given a revealing amount of access to a journalist in a very long time. The last candid interview that I think she did at length with a journalist was an interview she did with Rolling Stone where she had them print her words verbatim. What she doesn't like is when other people interpret what she's saying and project their own analysis on top of it. And I think also what she's subtly trying to say here is that there's something to be learned from that experience, even if it feels uncomfortable. Um, the New Yorker did a profile on her. They never got access to her ever again, I'm pretty sure, after this. This was during the Speak Now era, or it was Fearless. It was, uh, it was early. Um, but they had a very revealing look at Taylor's the inner workings of Taylor's circle, particularly her relationship with her mother, you should read it. It's very interesting. But she has not granted access like that to a New Yorker reporter since. 
Um, I don't think that we're ever going to get another era of access like that where she opens up the doors to her life and lets someone peek in and follow her around and write about it for public consumption. Those days are long gone, but there are plenty of those out there for you to read if you're interested in seeing what she's kind of mentioning here and what she learned. Um, Rolling Stone has a couple of good ones off the top of my head. GQ, I believe, has a really good one that's very underrated. I might do a video about that sometime soon. Having the world treat my love life like a spectator sport in which I lose every single game was not a great way to date in my teens and 20s. Very true. I mean, that was kind of a catch-22, right? Like, she made the unique selling point of her work and her artistry being that she was overly candid about what she was going on in her romantic life. She literally put together clues for her fans to figure out who they were. She made it a sport, and she didn't like it when it backfired on her. Um, And, you know, totally, that's totally understandable. But I think she sometimes forgets to engage the part of her brain where she accepts some accountability for the fact that it was kind of laid out this way deliberately to sell records. But it taught me to protect my private life fiercely. Mm -hmm. Being publicly humiliated over and over again at a young age was excruciatingly painful. But it forced me to devalue the ridiculous notion of minute by minute ever fluctuating social relevance and likability. Mm-hmm. Now, she didn't devalue that until 1989. She was absolutely invested in and obsessed with courting good public opinion for a very long time. And, you know, it took her a while to get comfortable with not being in favor all the time. And I would say that she still more often than not goes out of her way to make that a reality. But I will concede that she's better than she once was. She has shut down the need for validation by turning off her Instagram comments. I genuinely think that changed her life. Getting canceled on the internet and nearly losing my career gave me an excellent knowledge of all the types of wine. Oh, for fuck's sake. (laughs) Enough about the cancellation. I wish she would stop bringing this up. It's so annoying to me now because again as i mentioned before the repercussions of the cancellation were simply not as dire as she likes to make them out to be cancellation is not really a thing when you are that big of a celebrity there is such a thing as too big to fail um taylor certainly rebounded and became even more successful than she was before that old saying any publicity is good publicity you know it really circled back in her favor i really think though she might not Though she might not like to admit it, these events in the long term do help her and they do promote her in a certain sense. Her artistry and her ability to write good music and to connect with people on that sense will forever shield her from any sort of real cancellation, bar her doing something heinous like murdering someone. Like, I really do think that Taylor can get away with a lot. And that specific circumstance, it was rough and it was hard for a couple of months, but the rebound was so so swift and her fortunes after were so elevated that I think invoking it constantly as the hardest time in her life is a little bit dishonest. I think she's been through harder things than that, that she's not as open about publicly as this. Um, And dog whistling about this all the time, I think is annoying and overplayed. Like she has really addressed this ad nauseum at this point. It should have ended when the full video was leaked and she made those Instagram stories. We should not still be talking about it now. It's enough already. Like we're over it. The other parties that were involved seem to be over it. Taylor keeps claiming that she's over it. She keeps claiming that she's forgotten that certain people existed. And then she makes commencement speeches six years later and brings it all up again. You know, I just kind of want her to stop talking about it. I just really need this discourse to end. I'm bored of it now. I know I sound like a consummate optimist, but I'm really not. I lose perspective all the time. Mm, This is a really interesting part of her personality that we don't get to see a lot. I think there's a Rolling Stone article where she talks about how she's a catastrophizer. We know that she's nervous. She's always thinking about the worst case scenario. um, And she combats this with her earnestness and her um, ability to be excited and find joy in life. But, you know, those are the two kind of central tenets of her personality, this absolute uh, catastrophic expectation that the worst will happen at all times but also this relentless optimism that allows her to have this beautiful creative open brain and the ability to connect with people on a real emotional level and this is very human to me this is why taylor is such an interesting character to examine because she's a lot of oppositional forces going on inside of her head and i love to think about them sometimes everything just feels completely pointless i know the pressure of living your life through the lens of perfectionism. And I know that I'm talking to a group of perfectionists because you are here today 
graduating from NYU. So this might be hard for you to hear. In your life, you will inevitably misspeak, trust the wrong person, underreact, overreact, hurt the people who didn't deserve it, overthink, not think at all, self-sabotage, create a reality where only your experience oh my God, exists, she knows all about that. ruin perfectly good moments for yourself and others, deny <laughs> any wrongdoing, not take the steps to make it right, feel very guilty, let the guilt eat at you, hit rock bottom, finally address the pain you caused, try to do better next time, Rinse, she's repeat. literally having like a mental breakdown on stage. I love it. It's so true. These are all experiences that she's had and is intimately familiar with. And I'm not going to lie. These mistakes will cause you to lose things. Mm. I'm trying to tell you that losing things doesn't just mean losing. A lot of the time when we lose things, we gain things too. Now you leave the structure and framework of school and chart your own path. Every choice you make leads to the next choice, which leads to the next. And I know it's hard to know which path to take. There will be times in life where you need to stand up for yourself. Times when the right thing is actually to back down and apologize. Mm -hmm. Times when the right thing is to fight. Times when the right thing is to turn and run. Times to hold on with all you have. And times to let go mm. of the grace. Sometimes the right thing to do is to throw out the old schools of thought in the name of progress and reform. Sometimes the right thing to do is to sit and listen to the wisdom of those who have come before us. How will you know what the right choice is in these crucial moments? You won't. How do I give advice to this many people about their life choices? I have goosebumps. You're on your own now. But the cool news is, you're on your own now. She is... You know, I really needed to hear that today. I'm also at a crossroads in my life. Yes, I'm not graduating from school, but I have a couple of decisions to make and various factors involved in making them that are scary and terrifying. And you know what? All of the things that she just said resonated with me. You know, you need to know when to let go, when to fight, when to run away, when to protest, when to listen to wisdom, and when to throw things out in the name of reform. Um, again, you know, Taylor is a writer, honey. Of course, she was going to give a good speech. She pretends that she has no wisdom to impart. She's not giving any advice. She's being coy. But actually, she is, you know, giving some very sound, sane, um, and not super biased from her perspective advice. She is a wise girl. She knows, again, she's the chronicler of the human condition. She is deeply empathetic. She can understand where other people are coming from. She knows what an internal crisis looks like. And I love to see it. I leave you with this. We are led by our gut instincts, our intuition, our desires and fears, our scars and our dreams. And you will screw it up sometimes. So will I. And when I do, you will most likely read about it on the internet. Anyway, hard things will happen to us. We will recover. We will learn from it. We will grow more resilient because of it. And as long as we are fortunate enough to be breathing, we will breathe in, breathe through, breathe deep, and breathe out. And I am a doctor now, so I know how oh breathing my God. works. What a legend. I hope you know how proud I am to share this day with you. We're doing this together, so let's just keep dancing like we're the class uh, of 22. Chills, goosebumps, amazing, beautiful. I. Mwah. What an excellent, excellent speech. Okay, um, how do I process all of that? I mean, I read it, but I didn't really get, you know, her delivery is so good. Her media training is so extensive. Her ability to be likable is so profound. I mean, you know, I loved this. I loved this. I miss having this kind of unfiltered access to her thoughts. I mean, I know it's not unfiltered. She absolutely rehearsed that to death. Um, you can tell by her delivery. And by the way, public speaking is not her strong point. Sometimes she nails it. Sometimes she doesn't. The Billboard Women in Music event is an example of when it didn't quite land the way that it should have or could have had she been a little bit less rehearsed. Um, she does have a problem with being casual and off the cuff and improvising because, like I said, she doesn't try to be effortless. She wants to put her maximum effort into every single thing that she does. Um, 
But I thought this was a wonderful speech, and if this was my commencement speech, I would be super happy. The main components of this speech that stuck out to me as being a sign of maturity is her emphasis on being discerning, catch and release, and also uh, not always knowing when to make the right decision and being less focused on goodness and making the right choice, and instead following um, a moral code where you do your best to follow your gut, but sometimes it will steer you wrong. And in those moments, it's important to have humility and to accept fault, apologize, and start over and look at every misstep or failure as a unique opportunity to begin again. Wow, that was like my commencement speech. Um, so I think that's all I have for you for this video. I loved this speech. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. Were you moved? Did you like everything she had to say? Was there anything she said that scandalized you or irritated you? Let me know. Also, if you have any you know, suggestions for videos, I'm always soliciting from you guys. Um, subscribe, like, leave me a comment, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye, Swifties.